um, just so, yeah, while I'm getting this stuff uh, set up and calibrated here, um, for homework problem two, the amount of catalyst that's in there is 80 kilograms. Um, and I updated the uh, canvas posting um, to state how much mass was in there. I forgot to add that to the problem statement. So 80 kilograms for um, problem six two. Let's go ahead and add that up here at the top. Problem 6.2, W is 80 kilograms. I'm thinking like after around like finals week or something, I'll probably just stream myself continuing that paladin as far as we can take it. It'll be the Sench 113 paladin. Uh, we'll just go as far as we can. Okay, so our various topics for today. We're just, um, again, focusing on, on more um, examples of the, the pack bed reactor. We're going to look at um, an, an example of the pack bed reactor that uses um, conversion. Uh, and so these uh, can come in a couple of different styles. You can use conversion um, if, for example, you have the types of problems that we've had on the homework and it just so happens that there's only one reaction and you think conversion is a, a convenient way to do it, um, you know, that's, that's perfectly fine. You can use it that way. There's another class of problems that are sort of different from that. Um, they're almost like toy problems. Like they're, they're, they're made up to be basically only solved in one particular way. Um, there's a, I think it, there are questions like part of the, the IQ tests uh, that are called minimum information problems. Um, and that's sort of what class these fall into, all right? That the bare minimum amount of information is given in a problem statement. Um, and so we have to try to look for patterns and things inside of the um, material balances and energy balances and stuff like that um, so that you know we can make progress on whatever's being asked. Um, there's a question over in chat. Will project two grades be posted before the pass no pass deadline? I think so because the pass no pass deadline is like end of week 10, I think is when you're allowed to, to switch. Um, and so I want to have those up by like the end of next week, which is week nine. Um, so yeah, you, you should have enough time um, to have those available. Um, so as a just sort of a, a general description, um, this is going to fall into what we would consider like a minimum information problem. So how far can we take a minimum amount of information? That's not a special category for like reaction engineering or something like that. It's just, you know, there's tricky quiz like problems. Um, they're like the equivalent of those little, uh, like wooden puzzle games that you can get where it's like you got to take it all apart or something like that or there's like a ball stuck in the middle and you got to undo it somehow to get the ball out right like brain what are they called brain teasers something like that um along those lines right so let's look at the one that we're going to deal with today let's say that we've got um this elementary reaction uh it's irreversible it's isothermal it's isobaric, right? Lots of assumptions being put on top of here. Um, the reaction is A goes to B. And all we know about this reaction uh, is that Kc, the equilibrium constant Kc, under the conditions for this reactor, uh, is equal to 5.8. Um, and we're told the following. If we have one reactor, it's going to go through a pack bed reactor, which as you'll see, it, it wouldn't really matter if this was a pack bed reactor or a plug flow reactor. The result would end up being very, very similar. Um, it's just we're going to have a, a different uh, notation that we'll have for our material balances. If we send a stream of pure A into this reactor, then we get that the conversion of A coming out by the time we're all done is 55%, right? So that's all of the information that we're given about this particular reactor. Uh, and then the question becomes, uh, what if, oh yeah, sorry, it's reversible. Good, good call. 
elementary reversible. What if another PBR that's identical, so another identical pack bed reactor, Uh, is placed after the first. All right, and then we're, we're gonna ask um, two questions about this. So we'll have one pack bed reactor here. It's like the worst pack bed reactor I've ever drawn. There's one. And we're gonna take the feed from that one, send it through that pack bed reactor, then take whatever's coming out of that pack bed reactor, send it into another identical pack bed reactor. So this is a pack bed reactor, this is a pack bed reactor, and we're just feeding it from one right into the other. And then the, the question that we're ha asking is, what happens if it's placed after there, the way that we're gonna evaluate what happens after we do that um, is to calculate something that's called the overall conversion, which should sound uh, familiar because it's similar to the single pass conversion um, that we've seen a couple of, of other times. So the conversion of A overall is moles of A coming in minus moles of A going out divided by the moles of A going in, but this is for the process, right? For the entire system. So from the very first stream to the very last stream, ignoring everything else that happened on the, the inside. So we wanna know what is the value of XA overall if we do something like this. So this is when, they, when the problem says, well, what if, you know, what happens when we do that? The way that we're gonna evaluate what happens is to look at the overall conversion, right? How does that change um, if we add this second identical reactor to the outlet of our first reactor? Um, we're gonna label the streams. So the first stream will be zero, our second stream will be one, and our third stream will be two. So over here, we know from the problem statement that this is pure A, and we know that the conversion that we were able to achieve in the first reactor was 55%. But we don't know what happened in the second reactor yet. We will. Um, and we don't know what happens overall, right? We don't have it over here. Good question. Would doubling the reactor have the same effect? We'll find out. Um, and so the, the first thing we wanna do is try to figure out what's the definition of overall conversion. So our overall conversion then would look like uh, moles of A zero minus moles of A two divided by moles of A zero, right? And the difference here is that it's stream two, um, not stream one. Um, if, if it were a single pass conversion, we would have called that stream one, but this is, um, the overall conversion, so we're referring to the inlet being the inlet to the system and the outlet being the outlet to the system. So another way to write this uh, is one minus Na2 divided by Na0. One of the equations that we're gonna have to fiddle around with here a lot uh, is the general idea of um, conversion. So if we have Na2, this is the same as Na1 times one minus the conversion that we are able to achieve in reactor two, right? So we're gonna to have to distinguish between our two reactors because they're gonna have two different conversions on them. Or at the very least, we're not going to assume that they're the same. We're gonna let the math tell us whether or not those are the same. Um, so we're gonna to refer to this as reactor two. I'm gonna put a subscript or a superscript Roman numeral two on there. Um, and this one as superscript one for reactor one, right? So this will be our first reactor and this will be our second reactor. So all this equation says is if we wanna know what's coming out of the second reactor, we take whatever's going into it, which is A, uh, and multiply it by one minus XA. Um, we could do the same thing for reactor one. So reactor one is Na1 uh, is equal to Na0 times one minus Xa. But now the Xa that we're referring to is the conversion that we achieved in reactor one instead of reactor two, right? So 
the superscripts on our conversion are changing, but they're changing in such a way that it's uh, changing with the subscripts that we've got on the flows. So reactor two is referring to this. So we've got subscripts two and one on our flows. Uh, and then the superscript one, which is backbed reactor one, is referring to streams one and zero because that's this stream um, and this stream. So we can take this and substitute it back into our overall conversion and say that XA overall, right, which is the conversion we get after both of the reactors, is now 1 minus 1 minus XA1 times 1 minus XA2, which we've made a little bit of progress there because we already know one of those values, right? We already know that this value is 55%. But we don't know what this value is yet. And obviously we don't know what XA overall is because if we knew that we wouldn't be doing the problem, right? The problem was asking us to, to figure that one out. So we're gonna have to solve for XA2, the conversion of A that we would get in reactor two. Before we do that though, we're gonna solve for some kind of information that we can get out of the first reactor um, in anticipation of needing to know something from that first one in order to solve for the second one. So it's, so I guess I would call it suspicious that they tell us we can get 55% out of that reactor and then we take exactly that reactor and just sort of copy paste it and move it downstream. That strongly implies that there's going to be some quantity associated with that reactor that will be useful to know when it comes time to analyzing the second reactor. So let's just start with our um, material balance on the first reactor. So we'll start with reactor one. What does that material balance look like? That would look like in terms of conversion. So it, it's a good idea to use conversion here because we have been told that the thing we are interested in is conversion. So that will be equal to minus RA prime over NA zero. The reason that we get to write that is because the uh, NA zero that's here, I shouldn't say the reason we get to write that, that's the material balance. But we should keep in mind that the NA zero that's here is referring to the feed of the reactor. Uh, and it just happens that the feed of the reactor to reactor one is designated as stream zero. Um, we're going to come back to that in a moment uh, and have to go a little bit further um, than something like that. Uh, if we want to dig into our rate law a little bit, um, it's an elementary reversible. So it's going to look something like CA minus CB divided by our equilibrium constant KC. And so a, a key equation that we're going to have to use now uh, is... Did I already add that it was liquid? Let's add up here really quick. It's also liquid. Forgot to say earlier that the, all of the streams here are, are liquid streams. So for a liquid, we can relate the concentrations anywhere inside of there to um, the conversion with an expression like C sub i is equal to CA zero times theta i minus this weird ratio of stoichiometric coefficients of i over a times the conversion of a. So we're going to come back to that. We're going to use that a couple of times here. Um, so it's important to remember um, that this was something that we saw way back in um, chapter 5. This is equation 5.11. We're going to use that a couple of times. Do we need to indicate that the conversion is for, there's a question in chat, do we need to indicate that the conversion um, is for reactor one? Uh, yes, um, I've just dropped a bunch of the superscripts. Um, so another way to do this would be to say that this is uh, the conversion in reactor one. This is the weight of catalyst in reactor one. Um, and we're gonna, you could add those subscripts anywhere on a parameter that has to do with reactor one. I have sort of, jumped around that by just saying everything I'm talking about right now um, is for reactor one. Um, but yeah, you could definitely indicate on both of those with a, a subscript or a superscript that we're talking about reactor one. So with those um, concentrations, which just as a reminder, the theta i here, theta i uh, is defined as the moles of i entering the reactor divided by the moles of a entering the reactor. 
again, it, it's entering the reactor, which for the first reactor happens to be uh, stream zero. So we can change that if we go to the second reactor. It wouldn't be Ni0 and Na0, it'd now be Ni1 and Na1. Um, and we'll get to that when we deal with the second reactor. So we can expand our um, rate a little bit uh, and say that this is now equal to K. The concentration of A for a liquid stream is related to the conversion of A as CA naught times one minus XA. And then our concentration of B will be C sub A zero times XA. How did we know how to write that? Uh, we knew this because theta B is equal to zero. Right, there's no B coming into the system. We were told that it was pure A. So we can write that as CA naught times XA. And then all of this over KC. That's a really ugly KC. Let's try and get that a little bit better. There we go, KC. Some of these are constant, some of them aren't. Um, but we can rearrange this here a little bit uh, and pull out some of the common parameters and write that the um, rate is equal to k c a naught. And then sitting on the inside will be one minus x a minus x a over k c. We can put this into our um, rate law. This, by the way, happens to be the same as minus r a prime. So uh, actually, I've been a little bit sloppy with my primes. Let's go ahead and add primes to all of these. Right, and all the adding the prime does is it, it allows us to not carry around one more thing, right? If we could have written this as without the primes and it would have been fine, but then in order to get to the prime, we would have had to divide everything by row bed and we would have ended up with exactly the same expression. It just would have been a K over row bed. So I'm just gonna use the primes here to of keep us from having to write um, row bed everywhere. So if we um, substitute this back in, we're gonna go ahead and get rid of, by the way, the KC here uh, is equal to 5.8. So I'm using that in the next step. Um, I'm, I just don't wanna keep writing KC because it actually gets a little bit easier to uh, write everything if we don't do that. So the material balance, this term over here is gonna come over to the left-hand side of our material balance because that's a function of XA. Um, so we wanna stuff that over onto the left-hand side. Um, and so this will end up looking like one minus uh, 0 0.17 times XA. So the 0 0.17 comes because I did a little bit of factoring here with the 5.8. Right, if I factor out the XA, I'll get XA times one minus one over 5.8. And I just did that math um, so that we don't have to keep carrying around that uh, set of lumped parameters. And then on the other side uh, will be our K prime times CA zero divided by NA zero times DW. So that's our material balance, right? We took this expression for RA that we have right here, which was supposed to be highlighted. We took that, plugged it in up here for our uh, material balance, and then we moved these terms to do with the XA over to the left-hand side down here and moved everything else over to the right-hand side um, just so that we could keep things separate. We can actually rewrite this a little bit because there's a, a term here. So I'm trying to find ways to rewrite this so we don't have to carry around as many variables. There's no reason we couldn't leave these in here, but this happens to be equal to one over V zero because NA zero and CA zero are related in that way. So we've got K prime divided by V zero times DW. Right, a little bit easier um, so that we don't have to, to write as much. But we would be in the same place if we didn't do that. Our conversion then goes from zero to XA. And here is actually where I'm going to specify that this is the conversion in reactor one. Uh, and then over here, mm. that is, it is really hard to draw decent looking integral signs. That one's not bad. Uh, zero up to the amount of catalyst uh, in reactor one. All right, so whatever the weight is in reactor one. 
um, if we were to perform this integration, uh, we'd be left with one over minus 0 0.17 times the natural log of one minus 0 0.17 XA. And here again, I'm gonna note this as reactor one because that's what I was using. Uh, I defined that as my um, bound for my integral. If you can keep track of which XA is which XA without having to use superscripts, that's perfectly fine as long as you can keep them separate in your head. Uh, and then we've got K prime W over V zero, where the weight here is the weight of, of catalyst one. And this is where we can try to identify a lumped parameter um, that could be potentially useful. So over here on the left-hand side, I don't want to draw in brown. That was for our, we were drawing poop the other day and that was why we had brown. This is 55%, right? Because we're dealing with reactor one. This one over here on the um, left-hand side, that one we we can identify that as constant. The reason we can identify it as constant is because the two reactors are identical. So if we look at the rate constant in reactor one, so K prime in reactor one, and we ask ourselves, is that gonna be the same as K prime in reactor two? So I'm gonna switch this to superscript so it doesn't sit right next to the other one because there's already a prime mark there, so we're running out of space. Well, they're both isothermal, and they are both operated presumably at the same temperature because we said that the reactor was identical. So because we know that the temperatures are equal to each other, so the temperature in reactor one is equal to the temperature in reactor two, that means our, our Henius expression, right? If we were to write K is A times the exponential of minus EA over RT, Whatever that value is, we don't know what it is, but we know it's going to be the same because A is constant, EA is constant, R is constant. And if the two reactors are identical and they're both isothermal at the same temperature, the T will also be constant. Um, and so we will be left with K being the same for both of those. So we'll change this to K1. K of reactor one is equal to K of reactor two. Similarly, the uh, weight of catalyst in reactor one is gonna be equal to the weight of catalyst in reactor two because they're identical, right? Somebody said, just copy paste the first reactor, make it the second reactor. And then finally, we can also say that, I'm gonna get rid of this just so that we can keep adding stuff here. The volumetric flow rate entering reactor one is gonna be the same as the volumetric flow rate entering reactor two because this is a liquid. So this is our only assumption that doesn't have anything to do with the reactors being identical. That was because things are a liquid. So with those identifications, we see that this lumped parameter here, the KW over V0, that's gonna be the same for both reactors. And that comes up a lot in these sorts of like tricky minimum information type problems um, is there's often enough information to calculate some kind of a lumped parameter that's the same for both of the reactors. And then that becomes kind of a key that will help you unlock more information um, for other reactors. So this one, we happen to know what this is because we were already told that the conversion for reactor one is 55%. And that tells us everything we need to know over on the left-hand side, which is therefore equal to this uh, constant that we just found that happens to be the same for both reactors. So this value uh, can then be solved to give, uh, let's keep using blue. We've got a nice color palette here. Let's keep using blue. What we find is that K W over V zero um, is always going to be equal to 0 0.577, regardless of which reactor I'm talking about. So that's going to be a helpful little tool that we have going towards the next reactor um, because it'll give us something that we can kind of shoot for, right? If we can identify that same lumped parameter for our second reactor, that will help us. Um, that will be something that we can uh, use. So let's go ahead and look at that second reactor now. So reactor two, we can always go back to our um, material balance on any of these. Is the K still K prime? Oh yeah, thanks, I forgot my K. Let's change our K prime to red, there we go. It's still a K prime, yeah. 
So for our um, reactor two, we can start off with our same material balance, which is dxa dw. It's still going to be equal to minus ra prime, but it's no longer. It's not going to be divided by na zero, right? The reason it's not going to be divided by na zero is because generally this term that's sitting here, it's not just na zero regardless of what you call na zero, right? This is always the inlet to the reactor. It's not just Na zero, like just don't don't imagine that it's always zero because maybe somebody used a different number other than zero to represent the feed of their reactor. So it's not just going to be plain old Na zero. This is now going to be Na one, right? It's the feed that's going into reactor two, which is the stuff that came out of of reactor one. Similarly, when we write our uh, rate expression, it's going to start off as R prime is equal to K prime times CA minus CB divided by KC. And our KC is going to be the same and our K prime is going to be the same, but the CA and the CB are not going to be the same. So we're going to have to look at those a little closer. The CA is still going to be CA zero times theta A minus the stoichiometric coefficient of A divided by the stoichiometric coefficient of A, which is weird, right? It's, we don't often write it like that. Um, so our CA will still be CA0 times 1 minus XA. That part is the same, but CB won't be the same as what we saw um, previously. Let's draw a little imaginary divider here. The reason it's not going to be the same is because the thetas aren't the same. So our general expression for CB for a liquid in terms of conversion will be CA0 times theta B minus the stoichiometric coefficient of theta b divided by that of a times xa. So our, our previous one, we had said that theta b was equal to zero uh, because, hang on, let me change how. Previously, this was zero. Wow, I can't spell. P-R-E-V. This was zero because we were looking at reactor one, right? And reactor one had no b going into it, but now, reactor two does have some B going into it because we produced B in reactor one. So we're not going to be able to get rid of that theta B um, and we're going to have to try to figure out an expression for that theta B. Uh, in order to do that, again, we'll go back to the definition of theta. So theta B, it's not just generally NB0 over NA0. Right? It, it's not that the subscript there has to be zero every single time. What it's saying is it's the ratio of the feed of B that's going into that reactor to the feed of A that's going into that reactor. So we're dealing with reactor two. The feed is not stream zero. The feed is stream one. Uh, and so this theta B will be NB1 divided by NA1. Right? So we have to be a little bit... Um, conscious of what is really being tried to be said by those definitions, right? It's, it's, we, did, we shouldn't use them uh, without going through them. Yes, thank you. See, somebody just pointed out, in that case, shouldn't these Cs actually be CA1? You are darn straight they should be. I made the mistake myself. Those are all CA1s up there. Let me highlight those. Highlight your mistakes. It's really hard to learn if you don't make them. If you go through a whole problem and do it perfectly, you tend to not learn a lot from it, right? Because everything just kind of worked the way that you wanted. But when you make a mistake, take a moment and highlight it, right? Point it out to yourself and say, I should remember that. So we should remember that. It should be CA1. So our NB1 that we've got down here, let me get something out of the way over here. How do we get NB1? Well, NB1 is related to uh, whatever was coming into the feed. of reactor one, so Na of x1, right? And we happen to know what that value is, so we don't have to, we know xa1, so we don't have to work on that one. Uh, and then similarly, Na1, which is the outlet of reactor one, is Na0 times one minus xa1.
right? We're taking this minimum information kind of far. We're, we're really digging into it here. The NA zeros here cancel out. So this one cancels with that one. I appear to be stuck on my wrong pin. There we go. This one cancels with this one. And so we're left with, since we know this XA1, I wonder why it does that. I swear I'm selecting the right one. We know that this is 55% because we were told that of the um, previous problem. We can now calculate theta B uh, as 0.55 divided by one minus 0.55, um, which is 1.22, right? And so this will be the theta B that sits inside of here. This set over here will still just be plus one. Right. Uh, I mean, let me expand this a little bit here. If you include that negative sign all the way out there, it's plus one. So this will look something like 1.22 plus XA. So let's push this stuff back into our R prime. So R prime will be equal to K prime. Let's remove the CA uh, and talk about CA1. So this will be CA1 times one minus XA. And then minus our C sub B. Our C sub B will be equal to CA1 times 1.22 plus XA. divided by KC, where this KC is our really ugly looking KC. KC, that's not really that much better, but I'm gonna go with it. And believe it or not, we're actually making some progress here um, because we can do a little bit of factoring out, right? We can pull this CA1 out and this CA1 out. Yeah, these XAs are for reactor two, but I'm trying to leave it in the same syntax that I use for the, the first one, we're gonna denote them as XA2 when we evaluate the bounds of the integral. Because technically these are XAs and CAs anywhere inside of reactor two. Um, we are interested in the ones coming out of the, the end and that's where we get to once we integrate it. But it's really the conversion anywhere inside of reactor two, um, which is why I'm, I'm leaving it off. We're actually doing what the mathematicians tell us we should be doing, which is to distinguish between the, con the, the variables that are inside the integral and the bounds of the integral, um, which we brought up a couple of times. It's like, usually we're pretty sloppy with that. Um, here, we're actually distinguishing um, between the two. of But yes, it's the conversion in reactor two. Um, so this R prime, uh, actually, let's just go back to our um, material balance here. Uh, DXA, DW, again for reactor two, uh, is minus RA prime over NA1. And this is gonna be, again, equal to minus RA prime, right? So we're not gonna have to, to change too much here. Uh, and we're gonna get a K prime, we're gonna get a CA1 and an NA1. And then that multiplied by whatever's going on on the inside, right? So this will be one minus XA uh, and then minus one over KC times 1.22 plus XA. Right, so we just factored out the XA or the CA1. The reason we factored that out is because this lumped parameter here, CA1 over NA1 is equal to one over V1 which is the volumetric flow rate going into reactor two and leaving reactor one, which happens to be the same as one over V naught, right? The reason that we get this is because that's a liquid. So that's convenient, right? We got rid of the CA1 and the NA1 and expressed it in terms of something that was entering the, the system, which is nice. It's a little convenient to write it that way. Now we can go ahead and, all right, I swear I'm getting the right pen. Okay, that time I seem to get it. So our DXA, we're gonna move all the terms to do with XA over to the left-hand side and all the terms to do with not XA over to the right-hand side. If we uh, plug through a little bit of that math just so that we have numbers instead of a ton of variables, we get 0.7897 minus 0 0.17 XA. So that's sort of plugging in, you know, I've got a 1.22, I've got a KC here, I've got a one over here, 
right? If, if you sort of expand that out and do all of the algebra, um, you end up with this simplified expression down here, which is just kind of nice so that I don't have to try to integrate something that looks like that, because um, that one's a little bit nastier. And then over on our uh, right-hand side, we'll have k prime divided by v0 times dw. And here is where I'm going to actually specify that we are interested in reactor two. You could have been doing it prior to this. That's fine if you had done the, the superscripts and the subscripts prior to this. Um, so the conversion and the weight of catalyst that we're referring to here is in reactor two. This is what I had mentioned earlier. I, most of the time when we do these integrals, we're pretty sloppy uh, and we don't care that this variable that is the, uh, the, the variable inside of the integral, it's not the integrand, the integrand is that thing, um, versus the uh, boundary condition up here. Technically, those are not the same thing, but mostly the mathematicians are worried about that. Um, and so we don't really care as, as long as we can keep them separate in our minds. Um, here, I'm actually keeping them uh, distinct, but only because it, it was how I thought it would be easier to, to do something like this. So minus one divided, if we go ahead and evaluate that integral, we'll have natural log zero, seven, eight, nine, seven on the top with the minus 0.17 XA. Uh, divided by 0 0.7897, where this XA that we're talking about here, because we have now evaluated it at its boundary condition, this is XA2. And this will be then equal to whatever we get on the right-hand side, which will be K prime times W over V naught, where the W here is reactor two. But ever so conveniently, this happens to be exactly the same expression uh, as the one that we found previously, right? That value is this value, right? This one, we had a K, a W, and a V naught. And we said all of those are the same, regardless of which reactor we're working on. And sure enough, down here, we have a K, a W, and a V naught. It happens to be a W2 instead of a W1. Um, and technically, that K prime is the K prime that you would get for a reactor two, not for a reactor one, but we already showed that all of those were the same. Um, and then through the course of the problem, we had already mentioned that this V naught uh, is the same as all of the other Vs. Um, so it, it didn't change. The part that did change is what happened over on the left-hand side, right? This 0.7897, that's new. That used to be just a one, right? When it was a feed of pure A, that was a one, but it's not a feed of pure A now. So we've got a 0.7897. But since that ever so conveniently happens to be equal to 0 0.577, what we've got is one equation for one unknown, right? The only unknown in here is xa2. We know that this lumped parameter is 0.577, so we can solve this for xa2. You could either do that by a bunch of algebra, um, which probably the easiest way to do it is just rearrange for xa2. But if we solve for XA2, we end up with 0 0.434, right? And let's compare that then to what we got versus XA1, right? XA1, which had a feed of pure A, was given to us as 0 0.55, which seems, uh, uh, it's consistent, right, with our uh, rate law, right? Our rate law was for a reversible reaction which was this fella, right? And so the more CA that we have here, the faster that rate is gonna go, the more conversion we'll get out of there. If we start to also include B, B is, op, is, is sort of pushing in the opposite direction, right? The more B that you have, that's gonna tend to favor the reverse reaction. Um, and so we're gonna have overall less conversion if we do something like this. Uh, there's a question in chat. Were we given the value of K prime? No, we were never given the value of K prime. The only thing that we were told like in terms of numbers was that the equilibrium constant was KC is 5.8. And we were told that the conversion for the first reactor was 55%. So we don't know K prime, uh, nor do we have enough information to calculate it. Um, all we can say is that this ratio of K prime W over V naught is the same for all of the reactors. Everything else beyond that, 
we have to try to figure out from doing the um, material balance. And so that with that, we can finally calculate that our XA overall, which we had derived previously as one minus XA one times one minus XA two, all being subtracted off of one there too. So this was XA one, this was XA two. So we now know XA1 and XA2 because we just calculated the first one as 0.55 and the second one as 0.434. Let me move my window. I hope that didn't mess something up. Um, so this will end up being, if we um, plug in all the numbers in here, about 75%, just a, a fuzz below 75%, 74.5%. Right? And that was the number that we were actually asked to calculate for this problem was what's the overall conversion for the second one. That's kind of neat to me, right? That's, that's sort of one of these brain teasers of how little information can we be provided and still calculate something that's a useful number, right? It's useful to know, well, what if I just put that one right next to this one? Um, it's an interesting question, right? What, what if we were to do something like that? Uh, this is an interesting way of, of approaching something like that. Right? And your initial intuition would have been slightly off if your initial intuition had been, well, the temperature is the same, the weight of the catalyst is the same, the volumetric flow rate is the same. Should it sound, it's isothermal, it's isobaric, it's the same size, all of this stuff. Should it sound like the conversion in the second one is also going to be the same as the conversion in the first one. Um, and that, that would be an easy trap to fall into uh, because so much about that problem is similar, right? And it's similar from one side to the, the other. If you had fallen into that trap, that wouldn't be the end of the world. I mean, other than it would be wrong. Um, the reason that you might fall into that trap is uh, I got to try to, this is going to be tough. All right, bear with me here. I think California has a little bay up here by San Francisco, and then it comes down like this kind of jiggles around, comes over, up. Let's go ahead and call that California. Let's go ahead and say that that's California. This question comes up, it has come up in the past on the California PE exam, right? This would be a question that would pop up on there and you'd say, well, how did I solve that? You can see now why you might be tempted to say like, man, all of that sounds really good let's just assume that that conversion is the same from one to the other. The reason that that would be tempting is because you would probably only have about 30 minutes to solve this problem, right? And if you are under a time crunch to solve something like this, your intuition may not be, I should probably go back and check to see what all of these things are just to figure it out. Um, the PE exam is, uh, that's not at all a silly question if you don't know what the PE exam is. If you want uh, what's called a professional engineer's license, um, which is sort of the ability to sign off on drawings um, and verify that they should work the way that they are, you have to take an exam for that. It's called the PE exam. It's usually specific to different states um, and it's specific to different engineering disciplines. So there's a chemical engineering PE exam, a structural PE exam, a, an MAE, um, actually probably just a mechanical engineering PE exam. Um, so were you to sit for the PE exam, these are the kinds of, uh, yeah, no, physical education, no. <laughs> um, hopefully they would not ask you to do this on a phys ed exam. But this is the kind of question that you have where the advantage of this type of question is not so much that the math is super complicated, right? It's not like the types of problems where we have to come up with 150 lines of code. This is really asking you, do you know how to figure out what's constant and what's not given this set of circumstances and then link them together in order to calculate something else? So it, it's asking less of a, can you throw this into the code and give me the plots and all of that? And more of a conceptual, do you know what it means to have a constant temperature reactor or to have uh, a liquid stream that has the same uh, volumetric flow rate on each one, right? Do you know how to accurately um, apply each of these uh, concepts. 
you would have to have an accurate understanding of how to apply these in the same types of uh, questions that we have like on our, our homeworks and stuff like that. Um, but it would be more of a, a, a fine tuning to find out if you understand that or not. Um, have I taken the exam? No. Uh, typically the, the tracks that you would take, a, a PE exam would be like sort of the, the equivalent of a PhD, but on the industry side, um, there's then, you know, if, if the PhD and the PEs are up here, right underneath that are sort of the masters and what's called the FE, which is the fundamentals of engineering exam. That's sort of like one that you would take after a couple of years of your uh, job after you graduate, you might take the FE. Um, and that's, you know, somewhere roughly equivalent to what you would do with an MS. Um, and then everybody starts from the, the BS degree, right? It's just, if you go to academia, the next degree you get is a, a an MS. If you go to industry and you want to keep you know, adding more letters after your name, the next one that you get is an FE. And then if you want to go even further on both of those, the PhD is the next thing you can do in academia. And the PE is the next thing that you can do in industry, all of which are optional, right? Nobody's going to force you to go take the FE. Um, nobody's going to go force you to take the PE. It's just an option, right? If you wanted to keep going. Um, the challenge here is it comes usually several years after you graduate. It's tough to remember this kind of stuff, right? So there's usually a lot of reviewing that you have to do. Um, as you go. What's the benefit of using two separate pack bed reactor instead of one large pack bed, bed reactor? Absolutely zero. Um, there, you would never do what we just did of taking a stream out of a pack bed reactor and sending it back into another pack bed reactor that's identical and doing nothing to the stream in between. You would never do that. The advantage of why you would do it here is because they need a question to put onto the FE exam or the PE exam. Um, we didn't have time to get to that this quarter because um, we slowed everything down a little bit. But if you look at the, uh, I believe it's chapter 11 in your book where we deal with multiple reactors, um, there is some information in there about how do I choose what reactor comes next? Um, and this sort of a, a problem is in there. Um, and you would find out, not, not this sort of a problem, this sort of a problem to your question that you asked, why would you ever do one PBR followed by another PBR? Um, you would never do that. Um, it's it's always better to to just do one because um, you get the same answer and you don't have to worry about all that plumbing of of getting from one to the next. Um, is the FE the same as the EIT? I don't know what the EIT is, uh, so I would hesitate to say if those are the same. I, I don't know if those are the same. They may have changed the name. Yeah, it, it could be that whatever EIT stands for is now what they call the FE. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, the follow-up question to this, by the way, engineering intern exam, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, you'd have to, to Google it or Bing it if you like Bing. Another way to approach this problem, if, if you, I don't have the answer to this one. I don't know what sounds worse, engineering and training or fundamentals of engineering. It's like, hey, come on. We just spent like four or five years getting this degree. Can we do a little bit better than calling us like engineering and training? Like that's kind of rude, but that's what they do. So a follow-up to this question is what happens if you take all the B out? Right, some imaginary separator. You still have exactly the same two pack bed reactors but now you add this imaginary separator in between the two of them that somehow removes all of the B. Um, and so now the feed to the second one is pure A again. So calculate the overall conversion of um, A for this kind of a problem. So that's one that if, if this kind of a puzzle type problem appeals to you, uh, this would be like a follow-up to the puzzle um, that we just did right here, which I don't have the answer to. I, I didn't do any of that particular one. And also we're out of time, so we're not going to look at that one anyway. I, I had zero plans to do that. Um, but if you'd like to, to take a look at it, that's one place that you could go. But that's it. We are done for um, Friday's lecture. We are actually done with a lot of stuff. We're done with Friday's lecture. We're done with our pack bed reactors. We're done with week eight. Uh, we're done for the week, and now we have a long weekend. We have no class on Monday, so do whatever you want on Monday. Um, the next homework is not due until Wednesday. Um, it's homework six that's already been posted. Um, and don't forget that the um, weight of the catalyst in, in problem 6.2 is 80 kilograms, which was posted. 
Um, and then don't also forget that the uh, final project is, has been posted. The final project though is not actually due until the Friday of finals week. Um, so don't have a, a stress out here of, of, you know, I have to get that done right away. Um, you will have all of finals week to work on that one as well. Um, so I am in, in the interest also, there was a question in chat. Do we have a quiz on Monday? No, it's a, it's a day off. We don't have a quiz on Monday. Um, yeah. Yep, you have learned everything you need to know for the final project. The only thing that the final project does different from the first one is, uh, or I should say from the, the second one. So previously you had a CSTR here and it went through a separator over here. Right, and then this came back around with a little recycle, came out over here, came out over here. It's exactly the same thing, except now this is not a CSTR, this is a plug flow reactor. All right, so the vast majority of the code that you developed or potentially that you did not develop um, is needed for the final project um, because it's replace it, but do a PFR instead of a, a um, plug flow reactor. Yes, the final project is almost identical to the, the second project. And for that reason, I will not be posting my code uh, for midterm project two, like I did for midterm project one. Uh, I will not post code for midterm project two because if you read through my code for project two and understood it, there is like one line that you have to change. I mean, that and do the BFR. So maybe like five lines that you have to change. Um, so you're on your own for that for that one. I'm not going to post code for that one. Um, will quizzes be dropped before final grade counts? Yeah, we'll follow what's in the syllabus, which I believe is either one or two quizzes and one or two homeworks get dropped from your um, score. I will also post before the drop deadline or before the pass no pass deadline. I will post the grading scale that we'll use. Um, because it's it it is based on a curve, but I I want to give you that information now um, because usually things don't change much by the time we get the last like one or two assignments. So I want you to actually be able to calculate your letter grade. Um, and you are nobody here is going to offend me at all if you want to switch to pass no pass. Don't feel like oh my god th this was my class you should have taken this grades for letter grades not at all. Um, my advice to you would be calculate your grade. If your letter grade will result in an increase in your GPA, then do it. If your letter grade will result in a decrease in your, your GPA, switch to pass, no pass. Um, it, it will not impact, as far as I can tell, anything. Um, so I just play the game, right? It, it's, if, if you're given an opportunity to game the GPA system, which I hate the GPA system, and I think it's not a great indicator of who's going to be a good engineer, if you can find a way to game it, game it. Um, it's not that it's a useless number. I don't, I don't think it's like completely useless. Um, but if you have the opportunity to game it, I say go for it. By the way, we've been done for like four minutes. I'm not going to do anything new for like content or anything. So don't feel the need to, to stick around. If you do want to stick around though, if, if questions are done, I think we're going to try to finish up Act 1 on the Paladin. I think that's what we'll do. That's a good question. Do you, I think grad schools will frown, up, frown upon pass, no pass? No, I don't. Um, the reason being, the imagine you have to try to come up with two separate applications where these applicants had pass, no passes, and these applicants did not. There's no way they're going to be able to distinguish uh, there's no reasonable way they're going to be able to do that because virtually every applicant is going to have a pass, no pass on there somewhere. Um, and it, it's, it's just, no, they're, they're going to have to find a way to deal with it. I know th that we already are right. Our department has already agreed that no, we, we don't care if a pass, no pass pops up, then we just can't use that particular class as an indicator. Um, but everybody's going to be doing the same thing. Um, Basically, if you can look at like MIT, Berkeley, right, the top five schools, see what they're doing, everybody's just going to follow them, right? Because nobody's going to want to lose a promising graduate student to MIT when they could have gotten that student 
had they just ignored the pass, no pass. Like it, it's, it's not going to have any effect. I can't guarantee it won't, but it is my very strongly held opinion in my learned degree um, that it will have no impact. Where did I go to grad school? I went to Penn State. What's a solid GPA for PhD grad school in chemi? Or does GRE matter more? There's not really one number for grad school that sort of carries all the weight. Um, if you're weak in one of them, you can excel in one of the other ones uh, and it will balance out your application. So the, the sort of four big ones would be your uh, GPA, your GRE. Your GRE might not be important depending on where you go. Some of them don't need the GRE, but GRE, GPA, uh, any kind of research that you've done for um, your bachelor's level degree. So, and it doesn't have to be research. Like I went into a group and published a paper. Like that's fantastic if you can do it, but don't, don't feel like that's what I mean. You know, did you work in, you know, the Kemi Carr team, right? Where you went and presented your results at a conference or something like that. Did you work for Engineers Without Borders or something like that, right? That, that's what I mean by, by research, right? Using your degree outside of the classroom. Um, and then the, the fourth one is the letters that you can get. Um, the, the letters usually have to be at least like recommend. Um, recommend without, with reservation is, is problematic, um, but the stronger the letter that you can write, the, the better off. Um, you'll be. And that's, I should lump that more into like the application because your types of letters um, that you write, right? Your own interests, your personal statements are also very strong. Uh, I did research in a neuropathology lab. Will that look bad compared to engineering? Not at all. No, any kind of research in any kind of lab. It's, it's the ideas of how do I work on an open-ended project with other people in something in STEM. Um, those, those are the ideas that you're looking for. Um, if it happens to be neuropathology, at the very least, it would be looked at as, oh, great, you have experience in a lab. It can only get better if you happen to be working with a PI that would say like, oh, good, I need somebody with some background in neuropathology. Um, yeah, the, the only thing that can do is look good or better. Um, having research excuse me, experience in another lab, in another uh, discipline, would never be a bad thing. Um, it could only be like either that's good or that's really good, right? It's one of those. Did I want to go to Penn State from the start? Uh, not really. Actually, I wanted to go to uh, UC Berkeley and they sent me a letter, a rejection letter that said, it was like two sentences. It was, uh, thank you for your application. We had a very competitive pool this year and we could only take the best students. Thanks. Thanks, UC Berkeley. I know, right? It's kind of rude. It's a nice way to say that. <laughs> you could do a little bit better than that. Yeah, so in the back of my mind, I've always been like, I'm going to keep an eye out for a position at UC Berkeley as a teaching professor. I'm going to apply. I'm going to get the position, and I'm going to turn them down with a two-sentence statement. Thank you for your interest in me as a faculty member, but I could only accept the very best offers. Done. It's in the back of my mind. It's not going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> it's really not going to happen any, anytime soon. So if you want to hang out, I'm going to finish up our uh, Diablo 2 Paladin here. You can ask questions. I'll, I'll try to read chat to the best of my ability. How do I get these things to pop out? There we go. And uh, no, I don't want that one. Uh, that one. And not quite that big speaker view. Exit. Eh, grid's okay. Yeah, sure. You can keep asking questions in chat. I hope that I will be able to answer them and not lose my paladin but I will emphasize answering the questions over not losing the paladin.
yeah, you can send me any questions about um, future paths that you might be interested in. The, the one thing I would just tell you immediately right now, try to ask as many people as you can, um, because any time that I will give you an answer, it's always based in my own experience, right? And all faculty members have different experiences. For example, I have much less experience in industry than a lot of other faculty members do. Um, and so if that's a career path that you're interested in, it's not one that I can give a ton of information about, right? I'll absolutely give you my best advice, um, but you should check with other people too. This is no place for a warrior to die. Oh, I think chat is open too, so if, if you want to talk to anybody, feel free. Um, do I think labs on campus will open for undergrads to work soon? Uh, I, I think the most honest answer I, I can give you is I, I don't know. Um, the whole, we are sort of pulling back on, on some of the restrictions that we had a moment ago, or a couple of months ago, um, but it's kind of up in the air. Um, you know, essential personnel inside of a lab is typically dictated by the faculty member for that lab. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I don't know if the faculty members would, I don't know what they have to exert in terms of effort to get people into the lab and whether or not that impacts their decision um, as to whether someone should be classified as um, essential or not. I need to get better at reading maps. I'm terrible at reading these. Might have to settle for just the inner closer. I don't think I got enough time to get all the way through Act One. with those guys. They have a might aura on them. They're very strong already. 
Just, yeah, we're not gonna bug with it. Alright, we'll see what we can do by like. Let's see how many of the maps we can get through by like 415. We got four levels of this to get through, which is, it's going to be a, a stretch. I think we can do it. Though. I think we can do it. We'll see you on Wednesday. Oh yeah, I forgot. This is still recording. Oh, yeah. no, that's great. Well, if you're watching it on the recording, welcome. I don't think I'll run into any copyright problems for this one. I mean, streamers stream it all the time and nobody complains, so. All right, now there's a waypoint down here and the exit. I'm going to say that let's go ahead and do the exit because I don't think I'm ever going to want to come back because we're just going to move on after this to the next act. So we're doing okay, right? It's only 407. We're on level 3. All we got to do is get to level 4. And level 4 is really short. We got to take out the boss on level 4. These guys can definitely... You watch, it's going to be right where the entrance was. We're going to have to backtrack all the way. Is that it? That doesn't... No, that's not it. All the way back. Good thing I bought stamina potions. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, bum, bum. Hopefully this connects and we can make it through over there. Can't catch a break. gone left. We're all the way back to where we came in. I bet it's right down here. Right down over there. Look at how easy that was. Dink, dink. No. Explore the whole map. It's locked. All right, let's see if I can do the door trick. We gotta try to get through here, and we're gonna try and close this door on. Ah, there's a guy still right there. Missed it. Can I do it now? Close the door. Oh no, I think I closed the door. Close the door. Okay, I'm just gonna go. 
this guy. Okay. Let's try and drag her over. Oh, she hit so hard. Sure, we're not super poison. Ooh, rare ring. Nice drop. Ooh, sapphire. We've been happier with a ruby, but sapphire's not bad. Sell this for some money. My Go work back. here is finished. This it. Greetings. Go ahead and identify. Let's make our way over to the next stack. The caravan. Good yes. day. Let's go. Hello. Hi. Gonna drop our goodies off, sell some stuff. Then we're gonna wrap it up for today. Welcome, bro. It is an honor to serve you. Uh, uh, it's something for a boot. Not much. Two to strength. Wow, that's a junk ring right there. Move this over. Go buy some potions. How do I know I can... Hello. Drop off our runes. Two round. Uh, I don't think I actually need those for anything yet. So what we're building up to eventually we want a property that's called faster cast rate these two are going to end up giving us 25 percent faster cast rate this one's going to be 10 so we're going to switch over to that and then we've got another 10 here so 25 we're going to be at 45 faster cast rate it's going to be pretty solid we might be able to pick up an amulet that would give us a little faster cast rate uh, but we'll be in pretty good shape but we're not going to need that until level 18 uh, we're only 14. Actually, 18 will be here sooner than you think, so we'll be there. For now, we'll just focus on hitting things really hard with a mace, because that seems to work pretty well. Cool. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording this. Enjoy your very long weekend. We will see you back here on Wednesday. Stay safe. Be well. See ya.